Hello, my name is Torsten Huffler from ETH Zurich, and I am uh, very happy to be able to present at this uh, panel that is organized by uh, Martin Herbord at the Supercomputing 2021 conference in a virtual as well as uh, physical setting. So in, in, this, um, in this hybrid setting, here the online version, and the panel title is Successful FPGA Programming Tools, uh, Methods and Tools for High Performance Computing. So let me get started right away with my little panel speech so to, to uh, instigate a discussion uh, during the panel. So the question is, how do we dis define success? After all, successful is the first word, kind of implying that we are already successful uh, with uh, FPGAs and high performance computing. So let's try to define success in high performance computing. Well, it's all about performance, what we do in high performance computing, isn't it? So do we actually gain highest performance with FPGAs? Well, there was actually a, a keynote I gave at the HAR21 uh, symposium where I showed that we assume that we have FPGAs with very high memory bandwidth that are actually not really exist, that didn't exist at the time, they exist now, then a Stratix 10, kind of an oldish device, can be roughly competitive with the V100. Well, unfortunately in 2021, we are already at the A100, so these kinds of FPGAs, they still have to do some catch up in order to keep up for HPC, scientific computing simulations, with most modern GPUs. So maybe performance is not necessarily the largest success today for FPGAs, at least not in the context of kind of this high performance general computation. Of course, with specialized data types, you can gain a, a whole lot with these FPGAs. Well then, ease of use. Well, as a secondary measure in high performance computing, wouldn't we be happy if we would be able to use these devices much easier than we can use GPUs today? No separate programming, no complicated accelerator languages. Well, let's talk about this. Actually, at this conference on Sunday, um, Johannes, one of my students, and I gave a, a tutorial on how to program high performance uh, FPGAs for high performance computing. So, and really, one of the citations or quotations there from my student as well, if you spend some weeks, you can write some FPGA code in C++ that actually works. And if you spend some more weeks, then it'll actually work fast. But somehow, I would say that productivity is extremely hard to measure because if you're an FPGA hardware buff, then this is going to be much simpler for you than if you are uh, if you're just a normal imperative C programmer. So question is about wide adoption. Well, haven't we all heard the news this year that FPGAs dominate the top 500 list and FPGAs are everywhere? You know, unfortunately not. So the adoption is also still lagging behind. So what can we do? Well, I'll actually give you some ideas at the end of this kind of funny, um, a little bit provocative talk such that we can get the panel discussion started. So somehow we still have to have some investment in uh, to make uh, FPGAs more successful. But now to Martin's questions. So Martin asked a, a set of questions that he wanted us as panelists to answer. So the first one is for non-hardware specialists, what's the status of FPGA programmability, especially for HPC applications? Well, I'm not going to comment on this because I already did, but I'm going to show you this one picture that explains pretty much everything from the people uh, we have worked with that we're actually trying to get real applications on FPGAs. So the second question is, what is the programming environment of choice, OpenCL, OpenACC, other HLS languages, or hardware description languages? Well, of course, Martin forgot the most important one <laughs> coming from our group, the data-centric parallel programming environment, where we generate automatically from Python code, actually um, C++ HLS code for FPGAs that is optimized with all the principles that we were teaching in this FPGA tutorial this Sunday. So the second question, how should communication be implemented and what, what do we need to provide? Well, similarly, we have a work in my lab, it's called the streaming message interface, which is in, in some sense, MPI, the message passing interface, adopted to streaming devices like FPGAs. Here the idea is that we don't send messages, but we really send, need to send streams, which, is, which kind of contains messages, but we send the data of each message in, in a streaming way such that we enable pipelines much faster to go um, much at much higher performance than if we would be sending this as a message and the device on the other side would be waiting. Um, so what should, be, what should we be on the lookout for the near future? Well, I believe the uh, adaptive computing architectures coming out of uh, Xilinx, which is kind of the idea to coarsen the, the units away from lookup tables, but really have reconfigurable arrays or, or coarse grained reconfigurable arrays, how they were called in the past, um, that are then connected in, in a flexible way through a flexible interconnect, but the interconnect can be synchronous, and this is uh, quite important. So here are these uh, versatile devices, all of the first generation of these ACAP architectures. What is the broad perspective? Where will be in three, where will be the, in 
three to five years. Well, actually in three to five years, we may be back in, in the past <laughs> where um, Intel was actually going forward with the CSA architecture, configurable spatial accelerator, not too well documented. You can find it on the Wikichip webpage, but it's kind of this idea that you have coarse grain units or coarse grained units that are really good at scientific computing tasks and thus are fast, <laughs> as opposed to the FPGAs we have today or we had yesterday. Um, and they can actually be con uh, combined or connected in a user-defined way such that you can achieve highest performance with manually laid out data flow. So we are really going to go to spatial programming in the future, which is a very important paradigm shift. And I believe this has actually the potential to um, uh, to uh, provide speed ups over GPUs that are still somewhat load store architectures as we have them as we, as we had them in the past. So, but now the question is, how do we actually manage this in practice to get successful to be, or become successful in, in a couple of years and look out for our buff at the uh, SC25 conference where we can see whether we actually achieve those things. First of all, in hardware, we need more specialization. We need more efficient chip use because these lookup tables, they're great if you want to implement random or arbitrary functions that you need to reconfigure every now and then. But a floating point unit is a floating point unit, so we don't need to change the design of a floating point unit. So we should have high performance floating point and basic data types hardened in the architecture, gaining a speed up or in silicon efficiency in terms of in, in between 10 and 20x in practice. So then this will automatically get us towards more coarse grained arrays, coarse grained reconfigurable arrays, because now we could also put parts of the control flow around those specialized data type processing units. And there is going to be a little bit of an art, how much control flow we want to get into hardened logic, how much we want to keep in, in soft logic, but this is going to be um, all understood on, in the path where we are going. So companies are going to succeed and fail, of course, as usual. And then we will see what's going to happen. But at the end, we will end up with really more innovative um, fixed pipeline systolic array schemes that are somewhat spatialized, uh, uh, specialized and also spatialized um, and going beyond um, systolic arrays for matrix multiplication, which are today already heavily used in, um, uh, in, in the sense of the spatial computing devices. So on the software side, it's more challenging, I believe, um, because software is, in my opinion, generally harder to develop than hardware. Um, so we will, we will have to somehow decouple the domain scientists from the hardware details because it's going to be much harder to write code for these devices than it was for CPUs. So it's really going to be hard to translate a Fortran code to a spatial architecture, even though in my lab we are running several research streams where we are trying to understand how to do this. So we hopefully will get some kind of productive Python front end, look for data-centric Python um, on the internet, also on our YouTube channel where we present uh, multiple of those um, incarnations. So we also have to solve this mapping problem, which is an extremely hard theoretical problem. How do we map a data flow graph or a, a computational graph, a parametric data flow graph, to a fixed spatial hardware? And then, of course, in that context, we may have to reuse hardware units, which is even harder than just the mapping. And this is going to go uh, forward as one of our research topics, as one of the major research topics in, in my lab, the Scalable Parallel Computing Lab at ETH uh, Zurich. So with that, thank you very much for, uh, for watching. And um, well, see you all at SC25 at the bar, at the promise bar.